5th of September 2016. President Barack Obama became the first ever sitting president in US history to visit Laos. And he went there to pledge US support. Over nine years, from 1964 to 1973, the United States dropped more than two million tons of bombs here in Laos. More than we dropped on Germany and Japan combined during all of World War II. It made Laos per person the most heavily bombed country in history. As one Laotian said, the bombs fell like rain. The fact that the war extended into Laos in such a cruel way had a massive effect on civilians. For decades, there had been rumors about America's actions in Laos. Amidst fighting a bloody and public war in Vietnam, stories emerged of a brutal bombing campaign, unprecedented in size and scale, but kept entirely secret. It wasn't until 1997, 22 years after the conflict ended, that the US government formally acknowledged that it had fought a war in Laos. This was a high-risk, high-gain mission, to a point where it lays the foundations for future CIA missions. It shows that they can conduct the most covert warfare in CIA interests and do the job well. How did the CIA keep its largest ever paramilitary operation hidden for almost two decades? Why were they fighting a secret war in the Laotian jungle? For much of the early 20th century, France ruled large swathes of Southeast Asia. But by the 1950s, its colony of Indochina was breaking apart. In 1953, the Royal Kingdom of Lao formed. The Vietnamese Nationalist Party, the Viet Minh, led a long-running insurgency against the French forces in neighboring Vietnam. Their leader, Ho Chi Minh, hoped to make his country into a communist state. In 1950, he agreed to support his Red Comrades in Lao. They formed their own insurgency, called Pathet Lao. When American President Eisenhower took office in January 1953. He was determined to stop the spread of Soviet influence. Covertly, his State Department sought to finance other countries who were engaged in territorial disputes with communist forces. France's fight to reclaim its colonial past in Laos was the perfect testing ground. In the light of the uh, Geneva agreements that the main superpowers in the Soviet Union and the, and the United States agreed to respect the neutrality of the new governments that were put in place in both Laos and Vietnam. And in this context, against this backdrop, it really would have been unwise for the CIA to, to, to fight the communists in, in Laos using planes with a big US flag on the tail. Uh, it had to be done much more covertly than that. In the late 1950s, a group of American researchers arrived in Laos. They claimed to be from the US National Geodetic Survey, interested in making maps of the region. Their top secret mission, codenamed Hot Foot, 
was to stop the spread of communism. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. By subscribing to History Hit, you can access hundreds of hours of military history documentaries on demand. Follow in the footsteps of the Essex Dogs with Dan Jones or discover the history of archery with Ray Mears. We've built up an extensive library of history programs, hundreds of hours of documentaries, exclusive original films, interviews, and ad-free podcasts made for proper history fans. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. These elite fighting men were the beginning of America's clandestine intervention in Laos. What we see by the 1950s going into the early 1960s is the covert actions is starting to dominate CIA culture and CIA thinking. By early 1954, it was clear to President Eisenhower that France was not going to re-establish control over Indochina. The French had tried to cut off the Viet Cong supply lines in Laos by building a base in Dien Bien Phu in northwest Vietnam. Communist forces besieged the base. They used anti-aircraft guns to prevent the French from resupplying their men. The entire French garrison were killed or captured. The defeat brought a century of French colonial rule to an end. In an historic address in 1954, Eisenhower warned of the dangers of letting Lao fall to communism. His speech was to define US foreign policy towards Southeast Asia for decades. All of that weakening position around there is very ominous for the United States, because finally, if we lost all that, how would the free world hold the rich empire of Indonesia? So there's a great theory in Washington. Um, people, presidents like Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy, they worried that if Laos was to fall into communist hands, the United States ally Thailand would be next. The worry was that if Lao fell, then there would be a domino effect and you'd have the fall of Cambodia, of Vietnam, but even broader of a communist imperialism that would go through to Bangladesh and even India. Finally, a ceasefire line was agreed along the 17th parallel, dividing Vietnam into a communist north and a westernized south. Meanwhile, as part of the agreement, all communist forces were to withdraw from Laos and neighboring Cambodia, and free elections were to be held in 1955. Laos was classified as a neutral state and was prohibited from forming military alliances with other nations. Yet, even as the peace treaty was being signed, Washington was taking steps to subvert it. One of the many ironies of the whole of the Southeast Asia conflict was that the Americans thought they were defending a domino theory. They said, if South Vietnamese Vietnam goes, that will be the first domino, the next domino fall, then the next. And in fact, that was right, but it was the wrong way around. The dominoes actually fell backwards because in fact, the Laotian domino fell and the Cambodian domino fell and finally the South Vietnamese domino fell. In 1954, to try to protect its allies in the region, it established the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, or CETO, a regional defense organization similar to NATO. CETO nations ran joint military exercises across the Indian Ocean. But away from the public glare, its members disagreed on how best to use their troops to stop the communists, and whether and when to deploy boots on the ground. After Vietnam was split in two, America provided financial assistance to the South Vietnamese government in Saigon. American GIs were increasingly deployed to prop up the fledgling democracy. 
When a North Vietnamese torpedo boat attacked two U.S. destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin, Sito gave Washington the legal justification to go to war. Soon, America was committed to a bloody and high-profile campaign in the former French colony. Publicly, Britain and France refused to sanction CETO deployments in Vietnam or Laos. Secretly, however, the CIA and MI5 were able to use CETO to exchange information and plan covert missions. They didn't want Laos to fall to communism, to this imperialist communism, as they called it, because Laos was a, a vital piece in, in the puzzle. And if it was to fall like a domino, then they argued that a lot of other countries in the region would fall as well. Then, in 1959, their hard work to deter communism was undone. The Laotian government demanded the battalions made up of communists Pathet Lao fighters integrate with the rest of the military, forming, in effect, their own Red Army. Lao descended into a bitter civil war. Soldiers on both sides were trained by the CIA. It's a secret war, buried deep in the jungle not spoken of for more than 20 years. The covert campaign fought by the CIA in the Kingdom of Lao was wiped from the history books. So how did America end up secretly carpet bombing a small Southeast Asian nation that few had heard of? When President John F. Kennedy entered the White House in 1961, he was surprised to learn that the U.S. had 700 soldiers and CIA operatives in Laos. Secret war in Laos was off the books. One of the advantages of using an intelligence agency like the CIA to run a secret war is you don't necessarily need congressional approval. Faced with a communist uprising, his predecessor, President Eisenhower, had sanctioned the deployment of covert military trainers to wage a clandestine war. But the Americans were not the only ones turning a blind eye towards the Geneva Accords. The Soviet Union and China were also sending supplies to different groups in the Lao Civil War. The country was heading towards a precipice. The United States, when it got involved in Southeast Asia, was determined that it would fight a war in a different way, that it would actually be more subtle, that it would use its undercover forces cleverly and subtly. Startled by the Red advances and still reeling from the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, an attempt to remove communist Fidel Castro from Cuba, President Kennedy sanctioned a secret bombing campaign in Laos Operation Mill Pond. Operation Mill Pond was the plan by the CIA to take their B-26 bombers that were flown out of Thailand and to fly them into Laos and to bomb Soviet military arms dumps, but also Soviet-supported forces that were in the country. And this is all taking place at the same time as the Bay of Pigs incidents in 1961, and it was all organized by the same people. This marked the first direct covert commitment of U.S. military forces to the region. In 1961, Kennedy met with his Soviet counterpart, Nikita Khrushchev, in Vienna. They agreed to force all sides in Laos to negotiate. It is our hope that from all these uh, negotiations, become a, a genuinely independent and neutral Laos, which is the master of its own fate. As the US military drew back, the CIA seized its chance. CIA director Alan Dulles proposed a secret proxy war. Laotians would fight the communists on the ground 
and American bombers would provide cover support. The CIA really altered because of the Laotian elements of the Vietnam War, because it just became so much more uh, extensive. It began to involve itself not just in intelligence gathering, but in some real warlike operations. The Geneva Accords prevented Laos from forming military alliances with other nations. The CIA scheme allowed Kennedy to claim he was keeping to the agreement. Lao, he hoped, could be freed by covert force and influence from communism. Kennedy authorized a classified US military aid program to establish a secret army in Lao. JFK told the CIA to find exclusively Asian recruits. American men were not to be wasted on the effort. In a country where few could read or cared about the Cold War, this was not an easy venture. The CIA headquarters, Langley, tasked their Southeast Asia branch director, Bill Lair, with finding an army in Laos. He knew just where to look. In December 1960, he meets with General Vang Pao of the Hmong Hill people. Living in the remotest northern hills, the Hmong were a small tribe of some 400,000 people. They had a fearsome reputation and were very cheap. The tribesmen were happy to receive $3 a month in pay. A US Army private at the time made more than $300. What does the CIA do with the Hmong? They, um, they train them uh, and they arm them and they give them operational missions to, um, to conduct. Pao would recruit 39,000 Hmong soldiers with children as young as 10 being called up to fight. We know that this was a conflict that saw the use of child soldiers in fact, we have evidence that the use of child soldiers by the Hmong and by the communists was, was reported to the White House. The CIA had the soldiers they needed, but there was another weapon they were ready to deploy. In 1950, the CIA had bought a civilian airline known internally as Air America. Air America is perhaps one of the most surprising aspects of the Lao conflict because it was a commercial arm of the CIA. It was a front that allowed them to run covert operations in the country. Air America was a, an, a proper airline in the late 1940s that used to run on uh, a lot of the Chinese routes. It was connected to the Kuomintang during the, uh, the war of the 1940s. And the CIA took it over in 1950 in order to start running its operations around Southeast Asia. And the famous phrase of Air America was anything, anywhere, anytime, professionally. They would carry anything and they would get it there come what may. So they had their B-26 bombers that were scrubbed of all identifiable markings. But they also had twin engine transporters, large planes that moved troops into the country and back out. They also had smaller planes that had a shorter takeoff and landing. And this meant they could provide close air support on the ground, but also medivac any troops that needed medical attention. From a handful of poorly maintained planes, Air America now employed more than 2,000 people at its main base in Thailand. Its planes kept the Hmong supplied with weapons and food. Air America's top secret missions in the region were unconventionally managed by the US ambassador to Lao. William Sullivan had once been a peace negotiator for Kennedy. Now, he was asked to wage war. Ambassador Sullivan, who is implicated in all of this, he was sort of co-opted to a degree into what the CIA was doing with Operation Momentum in, in Laos and would go to Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearings on Capitol Hill. And when asked what was going on in Laos, he would talk about the civil war that was erupting and taking place, but he would never acknowledge 
CIA activity. Though they had to say to the public and to the world that we are only fighting in South Vietnam, in reality, they knew that to fight the war effectively, as they saw it, they had to fight the war in the North, in Laos, and increasingly in Cambodia. So that led them into using more covert methods. Thousands of troops engaged in pitch battles along the 17th parallel. The line, which had divided the country in two a decade earlier. The Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese fighting force, dug tunnels deep underground, beyond what American bombers could reach. They needed supplies to survive. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a military and logistical supply line, a supply path between North Vietnam into South Vietnam, um, encompassing parts of Laos and Cambodia. Um, the CIA in their operations in Laos wanted to disrupt um, the passage of troops and military equipment from North Vietnam into South Vietnam. As the American troops ramped up the pressure on North Vietnam, the Viet Cong moved their trail deeper into the Laotian jungle. So every time that the US would bomb choke points, the North Vietnamese would simply go around them or they'd fill in the holes. And before they knew it, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was moving through once again. This was vital. It was the core part of their entire military operations. Even when the Americans thought they blocked the Ho Chi Minh Trail had delivered between 60 and 70,000 Vietnamese troops, North Vietnamese troops, into South Vietnam. Soon there was a well-established system for directing war in Laos. Instructed by the US ambassador, the CIA directed her Hmong troops and received intelligence, which the Air Force then responded to. Air America planes kept the Hmong supplied. But vastly outnumbered from the start, the Hmong were decimated when they engaged the Viet Cong. General Vang Pao increasingly pushed his CIA handlers for more and more airstrikes to help his beleaguered tribesmen. Ten percent of the Laotian population would be dead when the bombs stopped falling. The classified US bombing campaign in the skies above Laos began in December 1964. The public wouldn't be told about this secret war for another two decades. In Laos, you have to feel for the individual Laotians. They were caught up in a war between the Pathet Lao and the government. They then found themselves caught up in a war between the United States, uh, the South Vietnamese government and the North Vietnamese. They could only lose from that situation. In contrast, the well-publicized bombing campaign against North Vietnam, known as Operation Rolling Thunder, began with great fanfare the following March. Air Force fighter pilots in Vietnam were asked to volunteer for a covert operation. Known as the Butterflies, these men were stripped of all identifiable military insignia. They then flew as civilian co-pilots on Air America flights, identifying targets for bombing. The group was so successful that in 1966, CIA branch director Bill Lair arranged for them to have their own aircraft. Codenamed the Ravens, these teams of two, an American pilot and her Hmong co-pilot, swept over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, guiding the bombers to their deadly intent. They flew low and slow over the conflict and their aim was to pinpoint where the enemy targets were, to help US forces guide in their missiles and to strike with deadly precision. But this put them at great risk because low, flying low and slow meant they were vulnerable to enemy fire. And in fact, it was the Ravens who took some of the highest casualty rates in the war in that region during the entire period. <laughs> 
Bombing campaigns carried out by U.S. fighter pilots in neighboring Vietnam made headline news. As we go through the 1960s and as the body bags start to mount and the casualty figures are reported back home and people are losing members of their family as they're drafted up and sent halfway across the world, the public support for the war invariably starts to fade. And it's at this point you start to get the, the peace movements and the protests in the streets of the United States. In 1967, some 100,000 anti-war protesters gathered at the Lincoln Memorial. This is an extraordinarily cruel, mean, ugly war. We are taking our boys, our government is, some of them with unformed opinions, some of them with more formed opinions, and we are forcing them to kill, kill, kill. A year later, the Viet Cong launched the brutal Tet Offensive in Vietnam, killing thousands of American soldiers. This dirty war was very, very dirty indeed and gave license, gave freedom, gave oxygen to some of the worst elements of, 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 of sort of human behavior. The death toll kept rising. By February, 500 GIs were dying every week. The protests led President Lyndon Johnson to order a complete halt to bombing in North Vietnam in November 1968. The United States realized that it could not win the war and President Johnson realized he didn't have enough support to carry on. The longer the conflict went on, the CIA's objectives changed uh, with respect to Laos. The primary objective became um, trying to make life as difficult as they could for the North Vietnamese in the larger Vietnam conflict. The objective became um, trying to divert North Vietnamese troops into Laos so that these North Vietnamese troops were not on the battlefield fighting South, South Vietnamese forces but also uh, American troops. But as Johnson cut back the attacks in Vietnam to appease American public opinion, he secretly increased the vigorous bombing campaign in Laos. Although the world could see that the United States was looking to withdraw, that it wasn't going to creep away, and it had to, as it were, it increased the bombing, it increased the offensives in Laos in order to get a better deal when that peacemaking began. The planes are diverted to the north, where the Ho Chi Minh Trail steadily increases in scale and strategic significance. Between 1965 and 1968, the US averaged between 10 to 20 sorties a day over Laos. In 1969, this number had risen to 300 a day. And the fact that the United States couldn't ever block the trail, they thought they had, but they never did. And the trail itself became part of the mythology of the, the victory of the North Vietnamese uh, over the whole Vietnam War. But even as the bombs rained down, back in Washington, few knew of the relentless bombardment of the Laotian jungle. CIA at this time was very much the personal agency of the president. Um, so the use of the CIA in this capacity as the president's personal foreign policy tool, it's a very clever way of avoiding congressional scrutiny and congressional acquiescence for the action that took place. Conscious of the increasing public scrutiny surrounding America's role in Vietnam, CIA officers took steps to cover up their activities. They created a fake headquarters for General Vang Pao, where he received visiting congressmen and other US dignitaries. Despite the deaths of hundreds of Americans, operatives, contractors, and soldiers who were all linked to the agency, the CIA's war in Laos remained secret for more than 20 years. It was very real, 
to the people of Laos, it was very real to the people of North Vietnam, and it was very real to the Air America pilots that the CIA was using. It was not very real to the American public. In fact, there was very little knowledge of this war that was taking place in, in, in Laos back home in the United States. But some journalists were getting uncomfortably close to the story. The Bangkok Post and the New York Times both featured reports of the fighting in Laos. But news from this remote kingdom barely attracted the public's interest. As the Vietnam War became a cause celeb, it drowned out the CIA's actions in Laos. A number of journalists at this time we now know were actually working hand in glove with the agency at the time. So these were journalists who the CIA was feeding tidbits of information. There was an incestuousness to, to, to journalists and spies during this time. In November 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president, the fourth president to oversee the war in Laos. It would later be revealed that Nixon played a key role in sabotaging Johnson's peace talks with the Viet Cong in order to ensure his election. Nixon understood there had to be a way of getting out of Vietnam. They could not win in conventional military ways. In 1969, he took office, promising to pull America out of Vietnam. But even as publicly President Nixon refused to sanction calls from his army chiefs to take US troops into Laos, privately, his White House pushed for more bombing raids in the country. In a candid conversation caught on tape between Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, Nixon asked, how many did we kill in Laos? Kissinger replied, we killed about 10 to 15. He was referring to 10 to 15,000 people in Laos. Both Kissinger and Nixon went to great lengths to keep the bombing campaign in Laos a secret. When news reports of the classified raids started to leak in 1970, Nixon ordered illegal phone taps on several White House staff. Both men were very aware that public scrutiny could quickly bring an end to their secret war in Laos. The Nixon White House was determined to keep it under wraps. So in dealing with the CIA, their attitude was, well, I'm, I'm kind of going to sign the checks, but not ask any questions. So there was no real public pressure for accountability on the CIA's actions in, in, in Southeast Asia and Laos specifically. At the end of the 1960s, public protest against the Vietnam War had reached a crescendo. The massacre of innocent villagers by American soldiers in the Vietnamese village of Mai Lai, exposed by investigative journalist Seymour Hersh, led to massive protests. But it was the deaths of four unarmed students at Kent State University in Ohio in May 1970, which truly turned the tide against the Vietnam War. The ensuing outcry caused Nixon to promise he would bring American troops home. There was no such fuss about the war in Laos. Deep in the jungle, the Hmong were losing the fight. CIA operatives began to report to Langley that their leader, Vang Pao, was becoming increasingly deluded about the state of his forces. Thousands of Hmong died, but Vang Pao continued to push for more battles. The longer that the conflict went on, the more Pao showed political ambitions of his own, and the more Pao actually wanted to turn this secret war into more of a conventional military conflict. Um, more and more requests eventually came in to the CIA from Pau for secret bombing. Uh, and this made it very difficult for the CIA because they'd given him their word that they would support him in, in his efforts to defeat the communists. Langley 
now had no further use for the Hmong. The mountain tribe's illicit activities were becoming an inconvenient embarrassment for the CIA. Narcotics had been grown by the tribesmen for decades, but always in small quantities. The Hmong's home territory straddled the border between Laos, Thailand, and Burma. Dubbed the Golden Triangle, for more than a decade, it became the world's largest source of heroin, opium, and morphine. The Hmong Hill people who live up in the Golden Triangle were regularly supplying narcotics, poppies, heroin, um, to the army and the army chiefs in Laos. Courtesy of the CIA, these supplies were invariably making their way to mainland United States. In 1970, the US military command in Saigon was forced to acknowledge a full-scale heroin epidemic. That dynamic between narcotics and warfare and narcotics and Western youth cultures really begins in the Vietnam era and it's never ended. As US troops started to withdraw from Vietnam, Laotians started sending bulk shipments of high quality narcotics to America. In 1971, President Nixon announced his war on drugs back home. Privately, his officials knew that much of the heroin which now flooded America's cities was grown in Laos, Thailand, and Burma, and shipped back home, courtesy of the CIA and US military. Uh, there's a great irony when you look at the Vietnam War that the people who protested most against the wars were consuming the drugs that were produced that were keeping the wars going. The CIA were implicated in this growing drugs trade. In the summer of 1972, a Yale University researcher, Alfred McCoy, testified that CIA operatives knew that the Hmong were actively smuggling narcotics. Now, Air America vehemently denied that this was narcotics. It's one of the elements of the, of the, of the whole war in Southeast Asia, which has attracted a certain amount of attention, but the sig political significance has never really been understood. But narcotics from the Golden Triangle kept money flowing to the government of Laos long after they would have collapsed into bankruptcy if they'd had to rely on official uh, taxation. The American bombing campaigns of the 1960s disrupted Laotian opium production by forcing the majority of farmers to become refugees. Poppies were left to rot in the fields as the bombs fell from the sky. With their American allies withdrawing from Laos, the Hmong faced up to a devastating defeat. Vang Pao always believed that if the war went badly, then the Americans would evacuate his people and provide refuge in mainland USA. Despite more than 15 years of covert operations, when the end finally came, in May 1975, the CIA had no such evacuation plan for the Hmong. After this conflict was over, um, hundreds of thousands of Hmong fighters who'd been promised sanctuary in the United States in return for, for, for fighting a US war, um, they never made it back to the United States. They were left to the mercy of an angry communist enemy. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands, were forced to flee Laos, leave their homes, leave their families to enter the neighboring country of Thailand. A select few, including Vang Pao himself, were lucky enough to be granted asylum in the United States. But the majority were left destitute, surrounded by the wreckage of their shattered nation. I think if you want to understand what it was like for the Laotian population to live under that bombardment, and some of the testimonies state that it felt like rain, and that makes sense, it's no surprise, because the US dropped two million tons of bombs on that country. When you break that down over nine years of conflict, that works out at a sortie of bombardments 
every 18 minutes, 24 hours a day. Since 1964, at least 50,000 Lao have been killed or injured by American bombs. 98% are civilians. There was a sense, I think, amongst the civilians that they didn't understand what this war was about. They didn't understand why this fight was taking place, because as far as they were concerned, they just wanted to be left alone. They were drawn into it. For the following two decades, between 1970 and 1990, the US government sent barely any aid to Lao, because most Americans were unaware of the terrible legacy of the Laotian War. An official record of the bombing campaign was only declassified by President Clinton in 2000. It was not until 2016 that Lao was honored with a presidential visit. President Barack Obama became the first ever sitting president in US history to visit Lao. And he went there to pledge US support. He didn't apologize but he wanted to say to the people that the US would invest money to help clear a country. 288 million cluster munitions and 75 million unexploded bombs were left in Laos. And this has had a dramatic impact on the lives of the people since the end of the conflict. These unexploded bombs led to the loss of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of civilian lives long after the conflict had, had concluded. Despite the scale of the human tragedy, for many, the war in Laos was the making of the modern CIA. The war was a success for the CIA because it gave the, the CIA kudos, it gave them gravitas, it gave them re respect within the dog-eat-dog -dog world of Beltway politics. And the fact is that the CIA always comes away from these sorts of operations saying, we did a good job. Well, tactically, they did do a pretty good job, but strategically, the fact is, history shows that they failed. Strategically, they didn't have success. They did not stop the North being able to strangle the South. America may want to forget its war in Laos, but it has not lost sight of the lessons learned there. Secretive drone strikes against forces in Yemen, Pakistan, and Afghanistan are a direct result of a proxy war pushed by the CIA. The CIA's pioneering use of contractors like Air America was to be repeated by US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. From small beginnings, the war in Laos turned the CIA into the world's leading covert paramilitary organization. And for more than two decades, this deadly campaign remained a complete secret, buried deep in the Laotian jungle.